So, good evening, everyone. Um, very glad to see, see you all here for the third Max Weber lecture, <coughs> third Max Weber lecture of this academic year. We are more than thrilled to have with us Anu Bradford from Columbia Law School, who's going to be talking about her new book. Um, and um, Professor Bradford will be introduced to us by uh, Vanessa Villanueva, who is a, a Max Weber fellow with us here. So please, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Juho. Um, we are uh, delighted to have today Anu Bradford. She is Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School. She is a leading scholar in the field of EU law and its regulatory power. And more broadly, her expertise focuses on digital regulation, international trade, and antitrust. She's very well known by her studies on the Brussels effect, a term that she has also coined. And following this tremendous success, she's going to present today her latest book, Digital Empires, the Global Battle to Regulate Technology. So without further delay, I will just leave the floor to Professor Bradford for her lecture, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Vanessa. Yoho, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. I am truly delighted to share this conversation with you. So um, I am going to tell you about uh, my book that came out in September, Digital Empires, The Global Battle to Regulate Technology. And, and maybe I start with the premise uh, of the book, which is that what I'm observing is an increasing consensus around the world that digital economy needs to be regulated. But there is no consensus on what that regulation ought to look like. So in the book, I argue that there are three primary ways to think about digital governance. There is the American market-driven model, there is the Chinese state-driven model, and the European, what I call a rights-driven model. So if I walk you through those models, the American market-driven model really prioritizes free markets, free internet, incentives to innovate. So the government is reserved only a minimal role and the governance of technology is in practice handed to over to the tech companies themselves. So it is a techno libertarian, techno optimist view of the world. The Chinese on the other hand, are very focused on making China a technological superpower and they are prepared to leverage state resources to meet that goal. But the Chinese government also deploys technology as a tool for surveillance and censorship and propaganda in an effort to ensure social stability and preserve the political control of the Chinese Communist Party. So where do the Europeans fit in this picture? So in the public conversation, the Europeans are often thought of as being forced to choose between the American digital world and the Chinese digital world, because the Europeans really lack the kind of strong technology industry of its own. But in the book, I argue that the Europeans are not willing to, nor are they forced to, to choose between the US and China. For the Europeans, the Chinese model is simply too oppressive, whereas the American model is too permissive. So the Europeans have articulated their own view and model for digital transformation, which is really premised on a human-centric view of digital development, where the priority is to protect the fundamental rights of individuals, preserve the democratic structures of the society, and ensure a more fair distribution of the gains from the digital economy. So the idea is that we are prepared to redistribute the gains uh, and the power from large technology companies to the smaller companies, to individual users, and to the society at large. So these are the three primary models that I think help us conceptually to think about the different values and principles that are then entrenched in different types of legal frameworks. You may wonder though why I call these three leading technology and regulatory powers empires. So let me say a few words on that. Because empires is obviously a big word, it is a provocative word, and I do use it more metaphorically. 
but I think it does help us understand what is going on. Because none of the three regulatory models that I outline are confined to the jurisdictions themselves. Instead, we see each empire proactively export its respective regulatory regime outside its borders. But what's very interesting to me is that each of the empires exports something different. So how the American digital empire extends its own sphere of influence is by exporting the private power of the US tech companies. These tech companies under US law were basically set free to grow and take over the world and so have they done. So the US tech companies are everywhere and people from all around the world are using their products and services. So if you take one example, just Meta's Facebook, it has 3 billion users in 160 countries. And through their presence across the global marketplace, they really reach uh, uh, or extend the reach of these American techno-optimist, techno-libertarian values. The Chinese digital empire gets exported through the infrastructure power that China possesses. So the Chinese tech companies are building 5G networks, undersea cables, data centers, smart cities, safe cities, basically exporting surveillance technologies along the digital Silk Road that reaches across Asia, many parts of Africa, Latin America, and also Europe. So what is the export of Europeans? So the Europeans are exporting the superpower the Europeans have, which is law. It's really the EU as the regulatory power that is the way to extend Europe's uh, sphere of influence. So the EU is often the most eager, the first one to regulate the world, including digital economy starting with regulations like the GDPR, but also extensive regulations on competition, content online, and now the latest frontier, artificial intelligence. The EU is setting regulations, which then often have a global impact due to this phenomenon that I have termed the Brussels effect. So this is where my new book is building on my earlier work of the Brussels effect. So. Um, the idea there being that the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few technology companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, they need to follow European regulations. But often it is in their business interest to, to, to extend those regulations across their global production and their global conduct because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So simply by regulating the single market, the European digital regulations often get entrenched across the global marketplace due to the business interest of multinational tech companies. So this way, what you see now is that in many parts of the world, you, you witness the presence of three empires. So if the first claim of the book was that the EU is an empire, the digital world is not just about a contest between the US and China. The EU is an empire. The second claim is that the world is not splintering into three separate spheres of influence. We don't have a Chinese internet, American internet, European internet, or the Chinese tech ecosystem, American tech ecosystem, and a European tech ecosystem. In many third markets, non-aligned markets, so markets outside of the empires, we simultaneously have the presence of the three empires because each is contributing a different layer to the digital ecosystem. You have many markets where you see US tech companies, Chinese infrastructure, and European regulations governing those American tech companies and the Chinese infrastructure present at the same time. So when you see that the digital empires are coexisting in third markets, you can already guess that they are also often colliding, which then leads to various conflicts. And a lot of the book focuses on these conflicts or these battles that we are witnessing in the global marketplace. So when we talk about the battles, I think it's helpful for us conceptually to think about two different types of battles, um, horizontal battles and vertical battles. 
So by horizontal battles, I refer to the battles taking place between the empires themselves. So the most prominent horizontal battle is the battle between the United States and China, the escalating tech war that, that manifests itself uh, by way of export controls, investment restrictions, whether inbound or outbound, massive subsidy rates, and, and basically ext uh, extensive decoupling of the two tech ecosystems. But there's also another horizontal battle that is very significant, which is the regulatory battle between the United States and the European Union. Here, the EU feels that the American tech companies are coming to Europe, they are taking too much and they are giving too little, which then gives the incentives for European regulators to extend their regulatory powers and rein in the US tech companies with privacy laws, with antitrust laws, laws on content moderation, and so forth, which then leads the Americans often to say that, no, 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 it's not our companies overreaching, it's your regulators that are overreaching. And here we see the transatlantic battles. But at the same time, we see the battles between the empires. Each empire is also fighting vertical battle in their own markets, the battles against the tech companies. So they are increasingly of the view that these tech companies have become too powerful, not just the EU, but the other empires and other governments as well. And they are looking for ways to regulate these companies. But what is important for us to understand that these two levels of battles are intertwined, the horizontal battles and the vertical battles, and the intersection of the two battles introduces elements of restraint. So think about Americans that are now reconsidering some of their techno-libertarian instincts and thinking that maybe we actually also need to start regulating the tech companies. You may have seen an executive order by the Biden White House on artificial intelligence. That's not pure market-driven model anymore. That's the US moving closer to the rights-driven model of the EU. But any effort by the US government to restrict the behavior of the tech companies in the US market takes place in the shadow of the horizontal battle against China, which means that the US is never going to be as restrictive of its tech companies because it would be eroding the very asset it has that it needs to prevail against China. It needs its tech companies to innovate. It needs those tech companies to produce the products and services that allow the Americans to retain and regain their technological supremacy, which is why we are going to see more restraint. So let me now move to the question that probably interests most of you, which is what happens in these battles and who wins? So who prevails in the horizontal battle and who prevails in the vertical battle? And here the book makes a few predictions. So let me start with the, the one prediction that I'm comfortable making, which is that the American digital empire is declining. The US is in the process of losing the ideological battle and its vision that is based on the market-driven model is increasingly losing its appeal abroad and at home in the United States. So the tech companies have failed us spectacularly and repeatedly that has led to a backlash and the kind of recognition in many parts of the world that digital economy cannot be left to the hands of the tech companies. They cannot self-govern, which means we need the governments to step in. So people around the world, many of us like American tech companies' products. We continue to use them. But at the same time, many of the harms that we are witnessing, whether it is the erosion of our data privacy, whether it is just noting how daily we are surrounded by hate speech and disinformation online, realizing what it does to our democracy and to our society, uh, is, is also something we attribute to these tech companies. So there is now a notion that American market-driven model no longer serves today's individuals and societies. And that is good news for those who like the European rights-driven model, because that means more and more individuals around the world and governments around the world think that the European rights-driven model actually best serves the public interest and protects the rights of individuals and are endorsing a variant of that model as a result. 
So if the European model is doing well, let me share three potential or real concerns about the European model's ascendance. The first concern that is very much in the minds of um, Americans when they are considering moving towards the, the EU model, but that is also now in the minds of, of some, including in the, in the European Union, right now in the final stages of the AI regulation, you probably saw the non-paper by the three leading uh, member states, leading meaning uh, significant in their political power over these negotiations, Germany and France and Italy, basically saying that we should be weakening some of the protections in the AI Act because we worry about innovation. So there is this very entrenched notion that the European rights-driven model comes at the cost of innovation, that the Europeans are probably better at protecting the rights of individuals, preserving the democratic structures of the society, but is that model ultimately compatible with great innovations? And when you look at the EU tech industry, look around and you don't see a lot of uh, great successes. When I ask abroad for the individuals to name an EU tech company, it may take them a while, but they can all name the GDPR. So in many ways, it is absolutely true, and I share the concern of the, the dearth of European innovation. There's a massive technology gap between the US and the EU. But I don't attribute that gap to digital regulation. It is not the GDPR that is holding the European Union back. Let me give you four other reasons that I think are much more powerful in explaining why the Europeans are behind the US in innovating. And I say them because I want to alleviate this concern that there is an inevitable trade-off between the European rights-driven model and, and innovation. So the first uh, important reason why the Europeans are not doing that well is that there is no integrated digital single market. The single market in this domain remains fragmented, which means that it's very difficult for tech companies to scale in the EU. They don't face the same kind of uh, obstacle in the United States or in China because of the large integrated domestic market. Second, there is no deep, robust integrated capital markets union in the EU, which means tech companies cannot fund themselves in the EU. They do well in the first few funding rounds. We actually have pretty good startups. But as soon as they start needing more money, they need to resort to US venture capital or they are acquired by the leading US tech firms. They just simply cannot grow big enough in the EU. Again, capital markets, not the GDPR. That is the problem. Third issue is that there are no incentives for risk taking in the EU. And true innovations don't happen unless our entrepreneurs are set free to take risks. It's partially cultural. Europeans are more risk averse. There's more stigma associated with failure. Americans are not that afraid to fail. But also it's a matter of law. The European bankruptcy laws are punitive. They really prevent the entrepreneurs to have a second chance. Whereas failing is just a rite of passage in the Silicon Valley. Lots of people are racing off the cliff, some of them fall off the cliff, but then they go and ask for more money, and they get more money. And that's how truly big innovations are born. And the Europeans just are not able to take that kind of risk. And, and trust me, a lot of people drive off the cliff and never really make it back. But when enough people are racing towards that cliff, something good happens. A fourth, and this is really important, another uh, issue that has very little to do with digital regulation. But you cannot have innovation unless you have innovators. And the US has been much better than the EU in attracting global talent. And, and if you just look at the, the um, over uh, $1 billion startups in the US, over half of them have an immigrant founder. That's not the story you see in the EU. If we focus for a moment just to the founders of the household leading, household name leading tech companies. If you think about Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, he is a son of a Syrian immigrant. Jeff Bezos of Amazon is a second generation Cuban. Elon Musk of Tesla is South African. 
Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, is Russian. Eduardo Saverin, the co-founder of Facebook, is Brazilian. Again, this is not the story of digital re regulation. It's the story of the US being extraordinarily good at attracting the world's best innovators to the United States. So that's my to-do list to the Europeans. They should not be eroding their commitment to rights in terms of digital regulations. Rather, they could be emulating the US when it comes to bankruptcy laws, immigration policy, capital markets, and so forth. And I think the US could uh, emulate the European digital regulation without fearing that somehow those would dismantle the US's capital markets or ability to harness the world's talent. <coughs> so if I now try to debunk the first concern I have about the European rights-driven model doing well, which is that it will lead to overregulation, I'm much more worried about the second concern that I have, which is underregulation. I think the Europeans should be doubling down and following through, which they are not been doing. So I'm worried about Europe being very good at promulgating digital regulations, but not that good at implementing them. The enforcement leaves a lot to be desired. And if we cannot enforce those laws, the European victory is a hollow one, because in practice, the market-driven model reigns. So that's something that is much, much harder to do. And I have all the sympathies. If you think about, you read about the Irish uh, uh, failing the obligations as lead regulator of the GDPR, it's a tough ask. So if you think about what is in the remit of the Irish Data Protection Agency, it oversees basically most of the largest US tech companies that are headquartered in Dublin. It is a tall order. Let me give you just one statistics to illustrate that. The year the GDPR entered into force, the budget of the Irish DPA was 9 million. It's about the same that the leading US tech companies headquartered in Dublin make every 10 minutes. They can hire a lot of lawyers and fight those battles with that money. So anyway, that's my second concern. My third concern, which I think is also real, is the idea that the European model has a lot of takers in the democratic world, but it doesn't have a lot of appeal outside of that world. And that outside world, the authoritarian and authoritarian leaning world is growing by day. And that part of the world is drawn not to the rights driven model, but to the Chinese model. So the EU has a hard time in many parts of the world to compete with the Chinese state driven model. And let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate why that is the case. So one is that we need to realize the significance of the Chinese infrastructure power. So there are many developing countries around the world that care most about having access to digital infrastructure so that they can gain access to digital development. And Chinese infrastructure is the one that provides that pathway. It is good and it is cheap. It is partially cheap because it's subsidized under the state-driven model with the financing provided by the Chinese government. It's very hard for European companies to compete with the Chinese infrastructure. It's also when the Europeans try to persuade, but our um, and Americans try to do the same, warning many countries against adopting Chinese infrastructure, saying you will be beholden to Beijing, you will be spied on by the Chinese Communist Party. This was a warning by the US to Malaysian government, to which the Malaysian government responded, what is there to spy on in Malaysia? So there are many parts of the world where privacy is not the number one concern that people think about and governments think about when they wake up. They have more pressing development needs and say that, look, privacy is the luxury concern for Europeans and for many Americans, and that's not what we are leading with. Second, why I think China is doing rather well and why it is hard for Europeans to persuade many countries around the world to abandon the Chinese model and choose the rice driven model is the following. And this was a very hard part to write in the book because I really didn't like what I was writing, but it had to be there, which is the observation that China has shown to the world that freedom is not necessary for innovation. They have managed to create a thriving tech economy without being politically free. 
I'm a huge believer in liberal democracy, and I like to think that all good things flow from that. But it's very hard to tell the people around the world that if you choose to follow China, you will not see economic growth. You will get control, but you will not see innovation. They look at China and say, look, it seems like we can have both. Here's my caveat, though. If you look at the developments in generative AI, you see that the Chinese companies are lagging behind the US companies. One reason is that those large language models needs to be trained with the kind of data and the outputs needs to be consistent with the censorship regime, which means that there is a limit to the kind of language that can be used for those models. And that is currently an obstacle for some of the Chinese companies. So there may still be American and European view vindicated that ultimately more freedom does correlate with more innovation, but you cannot look at Chinese track record of innovation and, and somehow dismiss the gains that they have made. So let me now uh, move to what I, I think I think is a segue from this, this concern about Chinese model doing well to the, the broader question, which is the, the most important battle of them all, which is the battle for the future of liberal democracy. And the book invites you or reminds you that this battle can be lost in one of two ways. So one way is that Europe and the US lose the horizontal battle to China. That means we see more digital authoritarianism, less liberal democracy as a foundation for digital economy. But the US and the EU should also keep in mind that liberal democracy will be eroded if they lose the vertical battle to the tech companies. That is also not consistent with liberal democracy. And here I do have a concern because the United States has a real difficulty in passing any legislation on digital economy. China doesn't have a problem passing legislation to regulate digital economy. Europeans are very good at passing generally uh, laws on digital economy, but the Europeans are struggling to enforce their laws against their companies. China doesn't have a problem enforcing its laws. If the Chinese Communist Party decides it's time to crack down on big tech, the Chinese Communist Party is cracking down on the big tech. If that is the case, we may need to concede that digital economies either governed by authoritarians, whereby democratic governments are destined to fail in that same endeavor, or that digital economy is governed by tech companies, and neither is consistent with liberal democracy. And that would really lead us to, and that's the real warning of the book, that we don't want to see a future where the true digital empires are the authoritarians or the tech companies. That should be a very unsettling notion for anybody who believes in liberal democracy as a foundation of digital economy and human engagement. So let me end it there.